Welcome this afternoon, folks. This is the Clint Bellows Show, otherwise known as Bellows Unplugged here at the intersection of faith and reason. And you can find us on YouTube as well as some other platforms, which we're going to get into over the next few days as we unfold uh, the launching of this uh, great new enterprise. We're delighted that you are with us. And uh, I'm a longtime uh, political consultant, fundraiser, uh, not a great candidate, but I've been an American. I've been involved and uh, I've been watching uh, things uh, go and grow since about 1975 when I was uh, graduating from uh, the university. And I will tell you that um, there's a lot to talk about. There's never a dearth of conversational matter out there, particularly on the internet, particularly on YouTube we won't suffer from any loss of uh, the ability to provide you with interesting things to talk about. But to lead off today, we, um, we talk about the intersection of faith and reason. That sounds like a pretty cool title, and I believe that it is. I believe that it really does reflect what we're trying to accomplish here, which is to um, help hone and improve and inform our mutual world visions. This may surprise you, but uh, God is not an American. How about that? He's not a Republican. He's not a Democrat. He's not a Muslim. He's not a Catholic. He's not even an evangelical Christian. God is God. He is supreme. He reigns throughout, and he does not have, um, you know, really much of a take on how we're doing with our economic uh, our budget. He doesn't care that much where we are with respect to health care. He doesn't care too much about really even where we are with the border. There is one issue, in my humble opinion, that will bring the end of this country. I don't want to be calling or shouting wolf all the time, but I will tell you, and I've been talking about this now for the seven years that I've been on radio and on YouTube and other places, there's an issue that God cannot continue to condone and why he hasn't judged the United States more harshly already, folks, is a mystery to me, but he continues to hold us in his grace for whatever reasons he has. I'm talking about abortion. I'm talking about the, the malicious, willful murder. Depends on what numbers you use. I've heard a minister just earlier today say 35 million abortions since Roe v. Wade. I've had other conversations with people that have studied this issue at great depth and for a long period of time, they say the number since Roe is more like 75 million. But whether it's 30 million or 75 million, that is, uh, that is just an unbelievable number. I mean, think about that for a moment. 30 million and 75 million, uh, you've got basically the population of California and Texas at 75 million people. Think about that. These are the number of completely defenseless human beings that we've exterminated in this country. And we were doing it before Roe v. Wade, but uh, once that became the law of the land, and it should be turned back over to the states, by the way, and it is being uh, courageously looked at by some states like Iowa, some other states announced this week that they are going to pass laws that if you've got a fetal heartbeat, you cannot be aborted, okay? You will have some rights. We'll see how they enforce those kinds of things. That is going to be a difficult thing to enforce. But folks, you either believe there's a God or you don't. We're, we're getting right down to it. You won't hear this on even Fox News. You won't hear it probably on a lot of other YouTube outlets. You won't hear it certainly in the national press. Uh, we're going to bring it to you with the bark on, okay, and tell you exactly our take on the critical issues of our time, if that's okay with you. And if it's not, you can find other places to go. I'm telling you, abortion will bring this country down. It is close right now. We've had many instances where the Lord has made us very aware that he's not happy with us, okay? And this is not anything to be taken lightly. Now, you don't have to be an evangelical Christian to not believe in the, the extermination 
of young people, be they a few days old, be they three months old, uh, be they, you know, third trimester old. Jews are allowed to believe this is a crime as well as a crime against humanity. Agnostic people are allowed to do so. Muslim people are allowed to do. Christians certainly are. Catholics are. How is this going? Why are we continuing to talk about this? To some extent, it's a national law right now that needs to be repealed, which is why you see these tremendous battles for Supreme Court domination in the United States Senate every so often when a Supreme Court justice resigns or dies or otherwise goes off the court. It's so important, I believe, for example, that um, uh, Justice Scalia, there is some question in my mind as to whether he died of natural causes or not. I, I believe that this is one of the terminal issues in this country. The judiciary is right now standing between us and uh, Babylon, as far as I'm concerned. What do you think? Okay. Now, there's a number of ways you can reach us, and my executive producer, Rob Hicks, who does such a wonderful job. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, you know, he's got a bunch of different ways. We will continue to inform you how to get in touch with us. This is a little trickier than my radio show where everybody just called in or texted in or whatever. You can text me at 949-887-9688. You can text me directly. I will take those text messages and we can respond to those on air if you like. Um, you know, I'm continuing uh, here, for example, um, um, you know, I, I get a lot of information and, and, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, bury the headline here, folks on every show, you're going to hear a lead off hitter. And that is my idea of the biggest issue in the country. The most important thing. Now this could be an evergreen issue, which is defined as one that is perp in perpetuity. Really, uh, it was based on principle. It's based on, not on current cultural or legal uh, jargon. It's based on God's values. It's based upon on virtue. It's based upon objective truth. And no one can argue about the fact objective truth in the area of abortion would tell you that when the when you look at a what they used to call a fetus, some still do, and you see a heartbeat or you hear it on an ultrasound and you see the development of features when this little person is a few days old, okay? not three, six, or nine months old, you realize that the extermination of that little person is murder. Let's quit beating around the bush. Now, I know this has been said, and I guess maybe I've said enough for today. These are enduring issues. We're not going to solve this one uh, right away. If you have some uh, discretionary income, uh, one of the places it can go is to organizations that fight abortion. And, you know, I can give you some of those later in the show, but I, you know, as far as the today's lead off shot goes, ponder this, ponder a balanced budget, ponder a world at peace, ponder the United States military playing their proper role in the world. Envision the swamp being cleaned out and everything operating the way it should. A great healthcare system, a border wall, you know, envision everything that you think idealistically we should want. And we've got all of that, except we've left abortion as the law of the land. I say to you, God's not an American. He will bring us down. He will not allow this to continue. What do you think? Rob, what, you know, I know where Rob stands on this, uh, you know, and uh, a great Christian man and uh, does a wonderful job for us. We are launching this at this point. So there might be, as Barack Obama said about something, I wish we had the sound clip on this. There may be a few hiccups along the way. Going to be hiccups. Okay. So the hiccups are my fault, not Rob's, believe me. I got some, uh, you know, just to switch gears for a minute, I got quite a bit of feedback on our inaugural program the other day. And uh, some of it was extraordinarily positive. Some of it uh, was a little bit critical. Uh, some good friends from Ohio uh, told me that um, 
they didn't like my eyeglasses. I didn't look into the camera clearly enough. Uh, there were a number of things I was doing wrong. And, and so, you know, and my voice sounded scratchy. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, you know, they indicated, and I don't know, I, I guess, Rob, you can see quite a bit on here because they said, my eyeglasses look dirty. Can you look at me and see that my eyeglasses look dirty? Okay. Um, and if they do, I, I want to know that. And I wrote, I wrote this one beautiful woman, a longtime friend of mine back and said, dear friend, um, I assume you gave me some great advice, but I can't really read it because there's too many fingerprints and dirt on my eyeglasses. I, and I don't know whether she viewed that as funny or not, but it was meant to be a joke. This is the Clint Bellows show, also known as Bellows Unplugged at the intersection of faith and reason. My Robin Gibbons is a gentleman by the name of Rob Hicks. And I, I don't forgive me for that. Let's uh, I just didn't think you reminded me of Evan uh, of Ed McMahon uh, or Joey Bishop or uh, Regis Philbin and maybe a little bit of Regis Philbin. Um, you are uh, this guy is really uh, in addition to his, his superior technical skills. He's an intellectual and a deep thinker. And uh, we get into some real discussions. Uh, we end up going all over the place but i think in general they're they're pretty pretty positive and they contribute to the format of the show uh, just a just a note about format we ultimately the goal is to get to a two-hour program with rob and i every day from five to seven eastern four to six central and uh, two to four on the west coast and we are going to be having guests you know that on my radio program if you happen to listen to it at all you would know that um I probably had uh, in seven years, 2000 different guests on my show. Uh, so I believe in spreading the ball around. These are not all conservatives or liberals or anybody else. After all, God's not a conservative. He's not a liberal. He is um, the great I am. He basically makes up the rules. We can modify them as we want, but those are just temporary. And quite frankly, most of the time they're ludicrous, aren't they? Do you think I'm droning on too much about this? We had uh, a number of people that liked what they heard. They thought it was a reason measured approach. I'm glad to hear that, but I don't want to be equivocating either. I want to come at these issues right out of the box and do it the right way. Uh, what I have for the time in the upper Midwest, a flyover country, which is where I come from, I have a time of 3.33. I think it might be a good time, Rob, just to take a quick break. And uh, if we can get John Milton Peterson on the line, we could bring him on now. Otherwise, we can continue here at the intersection of faith and reason with a couple of issues that are critical to the health of this country and to your understanding of what's truth and what's fiction. Back in just a moment. Hey, it's Jeff and High Def, and you're watching your guide to everything live, livemediaguide.com. Is video a part of your strategy for 2019? Hi, I'm Rob Hicks with Hicks Video, your remote video production specialist. Using equipment you already own, I help you deliver high value videos to your audience. From interviews and demonstrations to online meetings and trainings, I work with you to shape your stories and subjects that demonstrate your subject matter expertise. If you're a product specialist, sales executive, or business owner, we make video production simple and affordable. We do this so that you can make videos on a regular basis, whether it's daily, weekly, or monthly, to communicate about the topics and discussions that are important to you, your audience, and your business. To make your videos, we use HD video conferencing that allows you and your guests to connect to our studio from your home or office using your laptop, phone, or tablet. Once you and your guests have connected to our studio, we do all the rest. We take care of the TV graphics, the intro videos, the outro videos, the music, the behind the scenes production. Everything that it takes to either live stream or locally record your video for post-production editing to social media, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you name it. If you're tired of seeing the empty balloon commercials that are being made by your competition's social media experts, give me a call. I work directly with you, the subject matter expert, to help shape your story and ideas in a professional and polished manner via video. If you're ready to take a deep dive on your expertise and showcase the essence of your business via video, give me a call or connect with me online. I'm Rob Hicks with Hicks Video, the remote video production specialist, the doer's resource for online video production. We're back. Uh, Clint Bell is your humble servant, political, part-time political consultant and uh, personal political consultant for you, if you like, 
free of charge. Uh, sometimes my people say my advice is uh, worth just what you pay for it. Um, I, I find that somewhat disagreeable. Uh, we're starting to pick up some listeners already. I'm delighted to see we had a, a number of people uh, respond to us on YouTube. And uh, uh, one of them uh, goes by the term deplorable body. And uh, uh, I, I hope it's a deplorable Bob, Bobby. Okay, well, that's, that's just my whole joke then, because I, you know, basically, uh, maybe you can't tell by looking at me, but I'm, I am buffed out, okay? Uh, I wear a 52 long jacket, and uh, my waist is only 40. I know it should be about 37. Um, I've had every body and every bone and every part of my body replaced just about, and I've got, I'm scheduled to do a knee replacement on, uh, in the middle of June. So, yeah, I, uh, deplorable Bobby, I love you. Uh, is that with an I or a Y? That is it. Bobby with a Y would be a man, wouldn't it? It's a... DM, how you doing, man? Nice to have you with us. Oh, her, Donna Marie. I love that name, Donna Marie. Um, you ever hear about Donnie and Marie? No, that's a different deal. Um, do you know that Marie Osmond has lost 900 pounds now on Nutrisystems? She has lost 50 pounds a year, every year for the last 18 years. That's 900 pounds. She must be doing some serious binge eating, Rob, to put that all on. But I got to tell you, uh, as a mother of eight, um, she impresses me tremendously. And as a member of the Mormon church, she's got 25 times the courage and gumption of Mutt Romney, who this weekend uh, took uh, some more shots at the president and says, well, I guess... Uh, Donald Trump really hasn't done anything that deserves impeachment. Yeah. And in fact, you may recall, Mutt, when you laid down against Barack Obama, when you had him in the corner and you were knocking the crap out of him in that second debate, and then all of a sudden, you basically fell over like you were having a heart attack and let him back into the game, you Mutt. Uh, you are deplorable. And yeah, uh, de deplorable, uh, well, you know, uh, Bobby. Uh, I'd like to get your comments on Mutt Romney. It's easy to sit on the sidelines and take shots, Mutt. I'd like to know what you've ever done that's amounted to anything. I know you did a good job with the Winter Olympic Games in Salt Lake City years ago. I give you credit for that. I think you've got a tremendous wife and a nice family, and I think they all ought to disown you and find a real man to head the family. That's what I think. I'm telling you, you're going to get it straight here. When he jumps on Donald Trump, it's out of complete jealousy. Mitt or Mutt Romney has never done anything in business except eliminate American jobs and make himself a lot of money. Okay. Contra contrast that to Donald Trump. His holdings around the world are employee intense. Okay. He's employing thousands of people on permanent and part-time bases on construction projects across the country and the world. And after you get those construction projects built, Trump Tower, uh, his golf courses in England and around the United States, when you look at the projects that he's been in Las Vegas, that he's been responsible for, those are generating income producing revenues that put people to work. Mutt, why don't you go to, you know, Income 101 and take a class from the Donald before you knock him anymore. That's my take on Mutt Romney. I've got another couple of takes for you. I hope you don't mind. You've got it, baby. And uh, here's the deal. That's what we used to call a Jack Mormon. Okay. Anybody ever heard the word Jack Mormon before? And that isn't a guy named Jack whose last name is Mormon, okay? I have to tell you that I used to have a cocktail occasionally, and I, and I advocate mod modest drinking for a lot of reasons. But I haven't had, you know, I probably had one or two drinks in the last two years. I don't miss it. You may find this hard to believe, but I've lost about 50 pounds. Um, I feel my head's a little bit clearer. And, uh, you know, I once heard it said by a teacher of mine, uh, a survivor of the 60s in law school in San Diego, 40 years ago, said, uh, you know, uh, uh, reality is for people who can't handle drugs, okay? 
that was his basic deal. And, and I have to, I have to tell you, uh, he meant that. Okay. And there were survivors. Uh, my little brother who's not no longer with us was a great grateful dead fan. I'd never been able to figure that out until I went to a grateful dead concert with him in Las Vegas about 20 years ago. What an experience that was everybody in the world who's counterculture or just still hanging on to the sixties was at this steaming hot stadium in Las Vegas. I walked in. The only cool place was the tunnel by the football field out there where I think UNLV plays now. Uh, the only interest I had in anything was the, uh, the you know, where they had various um, interest groups, you know, like normal, uh, you know, the group that wants to have sex with kids, uh, these kinds of things. Um, one of them had a great bumper sticker said, it said, nuke a gay whale for Jesus, which basically succeeded in offending almost everybody. I don't know. Um, are we, are we cranking on these, uh, these listeners and viewers and text messages? Uh, this little program, the little machine that could, and, uh, we are, we're happy to be with you today at, uh, I have 342 It's 442, uh, on the East coast. Uh, it's 142 on the leftist coast, and we are delighted to be with you. You know, I, one thing I wanted to get to as well, and, you know, there's been a lot of talk about this, but it's kind of hard to believe how fast time goes by. If you have an opportunity to either find this uh, on the Internet or pick up a copy of Town & Country magazine this month, you will see a very well-written article about Jacqueline Kennedy that has been published in that magazine. I believe it's the June issue. She uh, died 25 years ago. Hard to believe, isn't it, that she's been gone that long. She was uh, 64 when she died, and she died of cancer. Uh, people didn't know that she smoked two to three packs of cigarettes a day every day of her life. That surprises a lot of people. Um, she was um, two different people, just as much as JFK was. Jacqueline Kennedy had a provocative side, depending on who you read and what you, t you choose to believe. She was not exactly uh, a complete opposite of JFK in terms of her extracurricular habits. And, uh, you know, a man or woman's sin levels are almost directly, uh, universally, persistently connected to their opportunity. Okay, if you have the opportunity to meet the most powerful and beautiful and influential people in the world, and you hang around with them and you're attracted to them, your interests are, by definition, more expansive than those of us in the American middle class or other people. Don't you think that's true? I can tell you that uh, I've been rereading a book on the Kennedys called The Dark Side of Camelot by Seymour Hirsch, who's a very respected but liberal uh, columnist and author. And uh, he used to write for the Atlantic Monthly, not exactly a conservative magazine. The Dark Side, you ought to pick it up. It's a paperback. You can get it on Kinder, Tinder, whatever that is. Um, uh, whatever, you know, the, you can read it on your tablet. But, I mean, the real truth hits the fan. Now, this brings up yet another comment, Rob, and I, that was a poll I saw that just came out, and it listed the top 25 candidates for president in the Democratic or Democrat Party. And uh, I don't want to take your time and list all of these people, but they broke down this poll, and at the bottom, the 25th candidate on there was somebody called Voter Fraud, okay? And this guy, Voter Fraud, is leading all of the other candidates, including Joe, I'm smarter than a submarine sandwich, Biden, okay? Smarter than Camel Harris, okay? Smarter than Hildebeest. Smarter than a lot of people, okay? Smarter than all of them. And these things all tie together in some semblance in my jumbled mind because Jackie Kennedy is famous primarily for marrying John Kennedy, which then launched her into the national consciousness forever. And then she followed up by marrying Aristotle Onassis, provocative to say the least. But she came to our culture by virtue of the fact that she had been married to the president of the United States. And that president of the United States stole the 1960 election from Richard Nixon. If you want to read 
exactly right down to the specifics of almost the precinct level, how they did that in Chicago, in Illinois, in West Virginia during the primary, in Texas and California, in a bunch of places, how Joe Kennedy spent millions of dollars. And in, in today's uh, inflated currency, I mean, he would have spent a few hundred million dollars to get his son elected president. That's a fact, okay? He, he, they basically bought the election. It did them a lot of good, to, didn't it? They ended up with two sons with holes in their head, okay? And a lot of fatherless children. So absolute power corrupts absolutely. I wonder if there's any karma or whatever you want to call it related to the fact that John F. Kennedy participated very knowingly in the assassination of three foreign leaders during the 2,000 days he was in office. That's a pretty big number. Nobody's ever come close to that. He had three of them whacked, okay? And he tried for a fourth one, Castro. That was Operation Mongoose. They failed to get Castro. They tried dozens of times. We've heard the mob was involved. We've heard, you know, all kinds of things. Castro beat the Kennedys. But I wonder sometime when we look at President Diem of South Vietnam and the fact he was assassinated five weeks, in fact, it was even closer than that, in the fall of 1963 before JFK made that fateful trip to Texas. You know, you, you, you kind of get to some extent at, at, at one point and another, there is a reckoning, okay? There is a balancing of account. Uh, God will not be mocked is kind of what I'm trying to say. God will not stand by and allow the United States to do some of the things it has done by the same token. Uh, perhaps he keeps us uh, in the position he's kept us in. And I believe that Donald Trump, like my friend Dennis Prager believed, I believe Donald Trump was brought here uh, to save this country. And you might say, I'm crazy. I hope you hit the, uh, the Twitter or the uh, YouTube or whatever feeds and uh, talk to Rob about that. I believe that, uh, you, you try to think where we'd be right now if the alternative had taken place. Look at the national landscape of the country. It, it's too bitter and too ugly to even contemplate. But we would be seeing things right now that, um, you know, I feel like Trump sometimes is the Dutch boy holding his finger in the dike. And, you know, it doesn't matter if, if there are uh, a bunch of uh, Democrats or Republicans in the House of Representatives and Senate in this country and controlling lobbying groups and controlling high uh, profit companies and uh, public interest groups. If we don't live the lives that we're supposed to lead, if we don't stand upright and righteous, and if we don't um, speak out against the wrongs in this country, all, you know, the old, the old saying that all uh, wrong needs, all that evil needs to exist is for good men to do nothing. And if you want to get right down to it, relative to what has happened since 1972? How many years is that? That's almost 50 years ago, okay? What have we really done? We've protested it. A lot of people, I mean, they, you know, um, they shot and killed Tiller, the baby killer in Kansas a few years ago. We don't condone that in his church service, by the way. Um, we believe in being gentle with the sinner, but hard on the sin. But at some point in time, folks, this, this account needs to be balanced. It will not hold. There is no way the Lord God can do anything other than be who he is. He cannot express a different character than the one he has, which is perfection, okay? Pretty high standard. And he ain't, you know, these are his people that this law of the United States says are killing. Our people are so warped that the former first couple, the Clintons, have a daughter named Chelsea, whose skill evades me, but she made 15 million bucks last year doing something. Uh, and um, the truth of the matter is she came out last week and said, hey, uh, if you're, you're anti-abortion, you're anti-Christian. Abortion is a Christian activity. And they, 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 come, they beat around the bush and they say things like, well, hey, you know, here's the way this thing really works out. You bring all these unwanted children in the world, what happens to them? How are they going to be brought up? And by the way, something like three out of four aborted fetuses or children since Roe 
by some estimates, have been African-American kids. Ask yourself what kind of political power and what kind of human skill have we lost and has the African-American community lost by killing, you know, 50 million of its little kids? You know, not all of them would have turned out to be a president of the United States or chairman of a company or another Sammy Davis Jr. or, or name whoever you want, Willie Mays, I don't know. But I will tell you this, they haven't had the chance to fail. And without the chance to fail, there is no possibility of success. We operate on the basis of capitalism in this country and success. And, you know, I, that which leads me to our first, you know, discussion of the day. I, and uh, you may ask what I've been doing for the last 40 minutes. I've been, I've been talking at you. I hope some of you will engage with us where, you know, Rob, but where exactly do people reach us at? People are doing it. Can you uh, come on and tell them uh, how to how to connect with the show, please? Yeah. All right. So we're going to try something because I'm never on camera, but I have pointed my microphone towards YouTube. So DM, if you can, or, or Patty or any of you guys can hear me, uh, let me know. But uh, we've got a lot of chat uh, pe people that are commenting. So right now we're broadcasting to the live media guide on YouTube, which is a- And that is, that's a Rob Hicks creation and it's brilliant, I, I gotta say. Brilliant. Well, we'll, Any we'll see, right? I <laughs> think it's uh... <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm old enough to remember the TV guide that used to come in the mail once a month. And uh, you know, you'd go down and have all the shows on and when they were on, have a couple little, Rob was a baby then, so he doesn't remember that but uh, he's created his own electronic viewer guide now, and we are on there along with a lot of other great programming. And we're gonna be adding other people to our lineup as time goes by. Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. I cut you off, go ahead and tell our people if you would how to get to us. Well, so uh, I, I just saw DM just said that she can hear me. So like I said, I'll, I'll have, oh, cool. you guys will have to bear with me as to whether Clinton and I are at the same volume level, because I wasn't planning on popping on camera but now that I've done it I guess I can do it again <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh, so I want to I want to say hi I to a few people those skills let, let, me, let me say hi to a few people that are so obviously deplorable Bobby was here earlier uh, DM who's moderating the chat for us she's a oh, she's a gem she's moderated all of the programs that I do indie music plus uh, walk away uh, diamond and silk when I was doing them um, um, Michael Gerber's program, just heaps and heaps of it, and she's delighted, just, to, delighted to have her with us, Rob. Yeah, she she's an amazing. Uh, what I put in the chat earlier was she's a, she's my secret weapon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's see who else we have here. Uh, Deplorable Bobby said that he is subscribed to the channel. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, we need to get your address or phone number or something or email address, and I'd like to personally interact with you, and thank you for being with us. And uh, if we can do that, I don't know if we can do that or not. As I said earlier, too, Rob, they can reach me by texting my smartphone at 949-887-9688, which seems kind of quaint now with the genius like Rob in the control booth. But uh, if you are dr driving around or uh, you're catching the show for the first time, or you can email me at Clint dot unplugged at cox.net all lowercase letters clint dot unplugged at cox.net we promise you one thing um if if rob were the uh, on-air uh, portion of this team we'd be hitting these issues a lot harder than i am i have to tone him down okay I, you <laughs> well, know, I'm i am going i am on air right now I, I, yeah i am 70 i'm going 75 miles in the third lane down the 405 uh, this guy is—he's—he's uh, he's got a, a, a crash a test dummy in, the, in a passenger seat, <laughs> and he's in the—he's in the, the, the carpool lane going 110, and uh, you know it's like the comedian Ron White said: all these other states are getting rid of the death penalty. I live in Texas, and we're putting in an express lane, and I love that <laughs> nice. guy. You know, and, and as soon as we get our sound effects going, we'll get to—you can't fix stupid, and uh, some other things that we used to do on the radio. Uh, when I was at Salem, so we're delighted. Uh, and um, yeah, should I shut up now, Rob, and let you continue, or where are we at with all that? No, we're good. So I, um, I guess in about another five minutes or so, uh, John Peterson will be joining the show. He's from yes, and from, we're delighted to have him on. Uh, yeah, so maybe, can you tell our can, can you tell our audience a little about him, uh, Rob? You're do you want to do that? 
no, you need to do that because he's your friend. I mean, I, I know very little about very little about him. All right. Well, he, you know, he he told me he couldn't tell me that much about me about him, or he'd have <laughs> to kill me. So I, uh, you know, I mean, this guy's a he's an hombre man, um, and we're going to bring in. You know, I used to do, um, uh, you know, I believe in kind of a magazine style show. I don't think you want to listen to me the whole two hours or, you know, whatever we end up doing. We can go longer if you want us to DM, whatever you want. By the way, what happened to deplorable Bobby? Okay. I thought whoever that was was saying deplorable body and I wear black for a reason, folks. Okay. It's uh, to, you know, to compliment my continental physique. All right. I've been told to back up away from the camera by Rob uh, because my shoulders are so big. You can't see all of me unless I back up. There may be something else he was talking about. I don't know. Um, we're going to be getting into some things with uh, John Milton Peterson, and we won't limit them to Second Amendment uh, items because John Milton is um, was one of the great guests on my radio show uh, for the last couple of years. And um uh, I began to contact those guests. I uh, was working for Salem and uh, in what you might call a middle market uh, metropolitan area. And uh, you may or may not know that there've been a lot of cataclysmic things that have happened in the radio business. iHeartMedia, the biggest, ra the biggest uh, radio company in the United States went bankrupt last year and they've emerged from bankruptcy but that tells you something. I mean, they've got, you know, a few hundred stations, FM and AM. If they can't make a go of it, um, that tells you that's an indicator where the industry is. Salem decided. Salem has a couple of hundred stations. And uh, I was kind of their top guy here in the Midwest and, uh, you know, had an opportunity to substitute for some of their national guys and, and uh, was really kind of feeling like, oh, wait, you know, I, I can't wait to put my pinstripes on again today and go up and hit uh, – third or fourth. Okay. And what is that thing you've got there? Is that one of those vape things? Did you see my article on vapes? Okay. Um, my, my niece's uh, boyfriends to use those things. I'm concerned. I got, I got to tell you. Um, but I won't, I won't harp on you for that. If you don't harp on me for eating three, um, Hebrew national hot dogs. Okay. If we, I mean, we, we all have our shortcomings, Rob. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to tell you. This yes, is the Clint Bellow show. Uh, we bounce, we bounce off it pretty well together. And, um, you know, we're delighted that you joined us today. Uh, we've got uh, John Milton Peterson coming up and I got to tell you, this guy is, I mean, his resume is literally a mile long. Okay. You said he used to be and a I Navy SEAL, I can tell you right? right down to every merit badge here. And when he was a boy scout, he was, was an he Eagle Scout. He was, he was a special forces guy. And I, well, hold on. I've got to go back and look at all of it again. Uh, because it's, it's, I mean, it's just amazing. Um, but, um, you know, hold on here. Um, he was, um, uh, you know, in the airborne, he was a ranger. The guy was a, a, the 20th special forces group, former special forces weapons sergeant. Uh, he has been in combat in the middle East, um, with the 19th and 20th divisions. He was in the infantry with the United States army walking around in a sand dune over there. And uh, I mean, this guy has been on the front line. He teaches people how to operate the most sophisticated weapons in the country. He is, among other things, a consultant to Smith and Wesson. So that tells you nice. uh, he has a high degree of competency and uh, <coughs> with respect to firearms uh, uh, selection. And by the way, you need to go out and buy as many guns as you can. Okay. And why am I telling you that? We're going to get into that with John in a few minutes, but. They're going to come for the guns. The, the, the Nancy Pelosi has already said uh, that that's on the table. Um, you know, and if you got to decide if you're going to be a Democrat or Republican, it's not that being a Republican is such a tremendous thing. I don't really look at myself as a Republican anymore. I'm more of an independent conservative. But I would tell you that if you believe the things sincerely that the Democrats are the crap they're trying to peddle, you're a subhuman human being. You can't peddle abortion. You can't peddle the, the uh, destruction of this country by unlimited immigration. You can't peddle crime in the streets and throttling the police. You can't uh, deal with uh, paring back the U.S. military at a time it's desperately needed. There are a million things these folks stand for that are just contra to common sense. They're contra to any spiritual 
uh, group, almost any that I know of. There are a few that are out there uh, that nobody really understands or can, under, you know. But for the most part, in the majority of the Judeo-Christian world in the United States, if you are true to your faith, it's pretty hard. If if just forget all the other issues, okay? Bring it down to one and say, hey, abortion's enough. I'm for people who want to get rid of it, and I'm definitely against people who want to maintain it. You don't have to go any deeper than that. How are we going to go do that? All right, we got John on the line. John Melton Peterson. Um, the last guy that was uh, had a resume as long as yours was Thomas Jefferson. Okay, I don't know if you know that or not. Do you remember him? Uh, I, I barely miss meeting him, yeah. Yeah, he... Uh, he did some cool stuff too, like you. Um, but uh, if it came down to a, a firefight or uh, trying to outsmart the bad guys somewhere, you're you're the guy I'd go with. Uh, if we're going to try to invent a lazy Susan or or uh, uh, some other kind of uh, machine in the late 1700s, or we're going to go to <laughs> or, or we're going to go to Paris with Sally Hemings. Uh, Jefferson had 16 kids that looked like Sally Hemings. I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, and yet people say Republicans are racist. I don't get that at all. John Milton Peterson's one of my heroes. I mean, this guy is like 18 hours a day, nonstop. You know, once in a while you can get into three or four minutes with him, but you know, we were giving people all of your qualifications. I just made the statement, John, that people ought to be out trying to acquire lawfully and get permitted with as many appropriate firearms as their family needs for protection. Um, do you Absolutely. Me? Can you give me your take on that? Why? And can you tell us what the forces on the left are continuing to try to do with our gun laws and uh, how that's worked out for other countries in the past? Welcome to the show, John. Thank you. And thanks for having me back, Clint. Uh, all right. So what can people do and what are the Democrats doing? Well, this is the most amount of attempted gun control we've seen in about a decade. At the federal level, they're trying, but they know that most all of the legislation that would come out of Congress if it passes would be dead on arrival due to the president and the White House's promise to veto. So where the action has been and where we're losing a lot of ground, unfortunately, is at the state level, the most number of bills enacted, proposed initiatives uh, going on all over the country, even in states like Vermont right now, they have several bills heading for the governor's desk that, believe it or not, passed that are now turning Vermont from what once was the, the state with the least number of gun laws in the books, theoretically becoming one of the most anti-gun. This is a tragedy for the Second Amendment nationwide. I've been tracking it, uh, writing a little bit for Farms News. Uh, the big thing I've been on lately is I've been down in Rhode Island. This is a good example for everybody in the country to hear about. Our smallest state, okay, is now leading the way. They have a Second Amendment sanctuary town movement that's going on. 100% of the towns that have voted on this have voted for becoming Second Amendment sanctuary towns in defiance of the state laws. It's really more of a symbolic gesture to tell the anti-gun globalist Democrat governor no more of this. Uh, they're pushing back, but in a peaceful way. So I've been in Rhode Island several times in the last few weeks. I have an article coming this week in Farms News on their website, farmsnews.com. It really does a comprehensive job of covering this, but I've been meeting with the planners, uh, Senator Elaine Morgan, who is a senator who's kind of the ramrod behind a lot of this, uh, at least for her five towns, and now it is spread. I think we're up to like eight towns now that want to sign on to this. Citizens are calling in and uh, calling their town councils and their legislatures saying, hey, enough of this gun control. We want to put a stop to that. And, you know, for the listeners to think, well, hey, Rhode Island's a small state. It doesn't matter. But it does because. Rhode Island was an easy domino for the Democrats to knock off for the Second Amendment, as well as a list of other uh, Democrat and leftist initiatives. But this was the first state to denounce the British crown during the American Revolution. This was the state that two of the signers of the Declaration of Independence came to. Interestingly, the towns that he, he was born in, uh, Hopkins, that is, and that was named for him have already voted for this. Uh, and then finally, the first president of the NRA, was General Burnside from Rhode Island. So this is a state that led us in the beginning, and now they're stepping up again. Both They know that they're doing this both for their own rights internally in the state, but also they know the country is watching. It is starting to get attention. And we've seen eight other states take similar types of actions to include, as you may know, with the sheriffs in Colorado for over a dozen counties saying, 
you know, in their case, they're saying openly, we're not going to enforce these unreasonable gun control that are passing through their Democrat uh, state government. We are at the high water mark right now of any gun attempted legislation. A lot of it has passed, as you know, with the bump stocks and red flag laws. Right. And frankly, this is also serving the purpose for the Democrats of turning people on the right and that are pro-gun, and including libertarians, not just right wingers, turning people against each other right now, causing us to fight over these things that we shouldn't even have to fight. It was already decided 240 something years ago and, and, and in 1791, of course, when they codified the rest of it. So we're in a bit of a crisis for the Second Amendment right now. Now, to answer your other question about being armed. Yes, of course. There's so many reasons to have a firearm for self-defense. And I'm not talking target shooting or any of that other stuff. I'm not really even interested in that. We're talking for self-defense and homeland defense. It's perfectly a reasonable thing to do. Uh, you know, being a fire instructor since the late 1980s, I have yet to see a semi-automatic rifle jump off of a shelf or out of a rack by itself and shoot someone. Yep. So... All of this propaganda and false narratives they're being, that the public is being pummeled with in favor of gun control, uh, it's, it's something we need to be very cautious about. And particularly when there's a mass shooting, they play on emotion and they basically pull up all their false narratives that both were enacted in the law and that have not been. Uh, and they try again. And as we talked about last year, you and I, they're going to keep trying this because one of the reasons is, of course, they have an agenda to disarm us. But the other one is they have nothing else left. The Democrats have no platform or success story to run on. The guns are one that they can run on because they've had success with it in the past. We saw that in the Clinton era in the 1990s and to include the assault weapons ban that went from 94 to 2004 and right. the frivolous anti-gun lawsuits to against the gun companies that attempted to limit the supply of firearms to the country by virtue of bankrupting one of our national treasures, our firearms industry. I worked for two of those companies right in the middle of that, Smith and Wesson and Six Hour consecutively. And times were tough in the gun industry. A lot of people lost their jobs or had to go to other industries due to the layoffs and so forth. So yes, we, we're in a crisis situation on that. But as far as self-defense, it's a perfectly reasonable thing. Go out and get yourself a handgun and concealed carry uh, buy a rifle or a shotgun or a carbine and learn how to train with it. There's a cottage industry of great shooting schools out there. A lot of guys coming out of the war, war and law enforcement and citizens, they're fantastic instructors. The country is awash in this. It's a great time to get involved in training yourself for self-defense. And another thing I think everyone should consider doing that kind of ties together what I just said about the anti-gun drive by the Democrats and self-defense is join your state-level gun group, your Second Amendment or right to keep bear arms group. Every state has between one and six groups. I'm trying to track all of them, if you can believe that. I've been in touch with many of them. I'm a member of seven knowing of them. You, knowing you, I can believe that. So uh, I'm trying to get all over this, man, because we're this. There's other things I would I kind of wanted to spend my time doing, Clint, in the last few years. But between having an editor ask me to cover this and just the desire to help out as a former troop, yeah, we got some problems in this country. But where the action is occurring on gun legislation and on self defense and giving people more ability to defend themselves is at the state level. That's where most of the legislation applies. So I would recommend get out $10 or $20, go online, and figure out who your state gun group is. If you don't know, get a hold of me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and all these places. I'll tell you who they are. Um, of course, we have to be careful now because there is a wave of opportunists. We're trying to take advantage of this, both for money or other reasons. And we believe that there's also some folks like Bloomberg, uh, Steyer and some on the left who might be funding groups that are opposing our top uh, Second Amendment groups, such as the NRA, Gun Owners America, Second Amendment Foundation. I, I'm trying to track now who might be doing that. Bloomberg did promise $500 million towards gun control efforts. I'd like to see where that money's going. There's some evidence that it is being put into play at the state level, especially. Um, so that's something I'm tracking maybe for a future show, Clint, but there is some uh, circumstantial evidence that they are trying to fund competing groups to destabilize, you know, the top three gun groups, which I'm a life member of all three. I'm not really here to advertise anyone, but I say join all of them. If you got the money. We need the money. They do good things for our rights. The time, is, uh, right the time is 510 Eastern, 410 Central, 210 on the West Coast. This is uh, the intersection of faith and reason. Bell is unplugged. And I am the aforementioned Mr. Bellows, uh, to paraphrase the old Dennis Miller shows. 
got one of my favorite guests on. We, we launched this program uh, because we believe that the um, terrestrial radio is going to hang on for a, a while. And, uh, there, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. We're trying to reach you. And Rob's going to give an explanation of this at a future show in some detail. But in addition to having great uh, guests like John Milton Peterson on to talk about the Second Amendment and the, the real ins and outs and, and a pragmatic view of why guns are important, um, we'll have a lot of my other guests uh, over the last seven years uh, from my Salem radio show on all on all national issues. And folks, um, maybe I'm, you know, we, we, we don't know the time and the place, but as an evangelical Christian, and I'm a Calvinist, but nonetheless, I, uh, I believe there is some divine determinism in the universe, but I think we're, uh, the stars are aligning toward a last times, if you will, uh, with the state of Israel and uh, what, the, what the Russians are doing, the Chinese need to do. Uh, you know, we've got, and, and uh, you know, we, we could talk about all of these things. Um, the truth of the matter is uh, some of these things are going to be almost impossible for us to deal with, even if we get everybody together and pull it in the same direction. Um, our population growth numbers, John, uh, just to take you, because you've got some good opinions on a lot of things. The American uh, uh, body uh, itself is failing to reproduce itself at a replaceable rate right now. It has fallen below two children per couple, whether they are in fact a married couple or people living together, or I guess a gay couple is, you know, they're gonna re register zero on the reproduction factor in many cases, maybe not, maybe there'll be some surrogate parents, whatever. Um, across the world, Muslim populations are growing annually uh, at somewhere between seven and eight people per family. Uh, they have overtaken Europe, as you probably know, uh, particularly Germany, France. Um, you know, London has become largely a Muslim village at this point. Once, I believe, uh, competing with New York to be the greatest city in the world, now has mosques in London that have things said on the signs in front of them. On London streets, one was quoted with, all Jews are pigs. That has a lot of ramification beyond just the vileness of the, of the statement on its face, doesn't it, for a lot of reasons. It, that dictates there's an awful lot of hate out there that um, we're, we're having to try to find a way to deal with. Absolutely. And I, I didn't, mean, I didn't mean to drop that on you, but you're, you're capable of picking up the ball. And, uh, yeah, I got it. Uh, I got it. Um, I guess what I can base it on, Clint, is what I've seen firsthand in the war zone countries where we're fighting the uh, Islamist terrorists. You know, I've been to a whole bunch of them, as you know, both as a soldier uh, in, in the Special Forces. Then I came back a number of times as an intelligence contractor. So I had very deep I guess understanding, especially because when you do that kind of work, you don't just do the targeting where you're dropping bombs or sending troops after them. You have to learn more holistically about the people, about the religion. You got to learn how to get inside their heads and what motivates them. And then you make a decision, whether it's a, uh, a leader in that country or an insurgent or a terrorist, are we going to go after them kinetically, which is capture kill missions, or in some cases we try to shape and influence these people. So to preface my answer, I'm saying that you know, I went over there not just as a shooter, but somebody who had got paid to understand these folks and figure out how to deal with them. Our government does a phenomenal job of that now, maybe not as much in the earlier part of the war, but I know from the special operations community, we've always had a handle on this. So I would say this, from what I've seen in those countries, definitely with the majority of them, they value human life less than we do. Anybody will tell you that, uh, that has been over there as a troop, as a diplomat, whatever, if they're being honest with you. Secondly, their quality of life is lower. You mentioned, you know, seven or eight people being spawned from one person. Well, that's partly because they, they don't uh, focus on the quality of life which you do. The majority of those places I went had no, definitely no running water or public sewage. A lot of them didn't have electricity. Right. We saw people who we'd go into their, their homes to raid the place or to meet somebody, and they were using car batteries to power lighting. They would switch the batteries in and out of their car, so they had two batteries per car, this, that's how primitive some of these countries are. When you see these, even the movies do a pretty good depictions now, the, the movie sets of these places that we've been. But I've seen it up close. I know what they're like. Yeah, there's some nice people over there, and some are devout to their religion. But they're, 
I'd say very high on their list of priorities in those countries, the way they're socialized and the way they're brought up, that violence and I guess I'd say more fascist solutions to things are higher on their list than they ever would be on ours. Right. Just how the, that many of these countries are. Now, you, I've heard people say, well, there's more moderate countries like Jordan uh, or Egypt. Now, Egypt's, of course, gotten worse uh, since about 2009, I would say. Um, but my point is, is that all those countries, the Arab, the Arab Spring, yeah, that was uh, what a joke. Yeah. Um, it's, it's it's hard for most Americans to understand because when you see a person who is Islamic over here, or you see about them on the news, you're seeing one of two versions. You're seeing the hyper extreme ones, like these two members of Congress we have now. They're very, grabbing a lot of attention. On the other end, you actually see the people who came here to get away from all of that. I've met many Iranians. Iraqis and other expatriates who've come here. I personally know interpreters who work for us that came over here from Afghanistan who are perfectly peaceful guys and they just want to have a life. So you yeah. do see a lot of people here in the States that did get out of there to get away from all of that. Unfortunately, within that subculture, there are going to people who are either now terrorists or potentially going to be terrorists. Many of them that the FBI, they call them homegrown violent extremists who just decide one day they don't like it here and they want to you know, be a suicide bomber, run over people with a vehicle in, in, in uh, Manhattan, in New York City. Yep. So that's that's the problem. We, we don't have, the, the average American doesn't have the time or ability to really understand them. And they see two extremes here, the good ones and the bad ones here in the United States. But take it from me, they, this whole thing about a caliphate and they want to take over the world and they're the only religion no one else is not and the intolerance, it really, it's built into the fabric uh, of what a lot of them are taught over there. What I'm talking about is the more jihadi, uh, extremists, the Wahhabis and Salafist subcultures over there. Most of these are the Sunni, which is a majority of Islam. Right. right. They, they, have a, they have a very high percentage of their people that do go the extremist way, and they are a danger to us and the entire world. We're talking to John Miller Peterson, who is a, a Renaissance man and uh, a gentleman who has served this country at the front lines of a lot of things. And uh, brings uh, experience and a, a worldview to this show that um, we're delighted about. And, um, um, you know, and it's, it's interesting. You mentioned a dual approach of, you know, in some places we we've, we've got to fight because that's what it looks like. Uh, some form of combat or confrontation. On the other hand, there's a woman by the name of Farah Pandith who has written a book called how we win. And in that book, she talks about the fact that in over 100 countries, uh, it's been inculcated into the fabric of the culture that it's us versus them with respect to Islamic extremism. And her comment is, is that is going to be a tough game to win because the estimate is there may be as many as 30 million young Muslims in the world that fall into the extremist camp, okay, based on what they've seen and their interest in becoming heroic or dying and you know for Allah or whatever the whatever the, the, the motivation may be 30 million people is um, more than we face yeah. I believe in all the wars we fought so far so uh, uh, that's something we have to view with a certain amount of uh, soberness on the other hand uh, you've seen uh, some of the people on Capitol Hill and a couple of the the new Congress people that have come into these districts and uh, th that's got to be a cause for uh, concern, doesn't it? Yes, and it's probably, it could be surmised, because they've stated that they would do this, that they, they did want to systematically infiltrate and take over our government. There's evidence galore of that to include cases of Muslim members of the military, that, uh, such as that we're helping folks at Gitmo from the inside, uh, convictions, and, of course, the... Uh, these two members of Congress were very disturbing, but that was a long time coming because they built up the subcultures in Detroit and Dearborn area where one of them represents and the other in Minneapolis. They had enough people to easily elect these two. So that was in a way to many of us, not a surprise. It is shocking their statements and their extremism. There's no, I think there's even a lot of people on the Democrat side that see through these two. Um, but for some reason they're being kept in play. Isn't that interesting, Clint? Yeah. The Democrats should be denouncing these two and making motions of censure or other parliamentary procedure in the in our House of Representatives to do something about these two. We all know what they stand for. Darn sure the Jews in Israel know what these two are about. Right. Uh, and, and what is good to see, though, 
what is good to see everyone's upset because there's all this strife both with them and against our president but we have a lot of really good americans rising up people who weren't involved before are getting involved i saw it at cpac there was as i think i mentioned yes, with you yes that's the last issue i want to talk with you about laura loomer and uh, your interview there yeah. and, uh, tell we're us unifying though we are definitely unifying like I've never seen in my adult life, been a Republican conservative my whole adult life. And, and I've lived in some of the most liberal areas that you can imagine, Boulder, Colorado, Boston, Washington, DC area, and born in New York. So I've got most of those places covered and went on a honeymoon in San Francisco and had been all over LA. So I, I got it, you know, I understand these folks and been surrounded by them uh, in all manner, try to get inside their head. But I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing of our citizenry, both rising up overall as individuals, but the unity, it's there, my friend. It's, it may be difficult, and a lot of people are upset by what they're seeing in the news, especially at the hands of the Democrat, and this, this derangement and desperation. But I have a positive attitude about this, and we already won the big one in 2016, and we're actually better off now than we were then. If you look at the overall trend, as you know, I was in intelligence channels for a few years, so I do know a little bit, you know, you, you look at an issue and you don't look at one nose bite, but you connect the dots. I think we have the position of advantage in the upper hand. So about that First Amendment, my friend. Well, you know, uh, you are an amazing guy. I'm, I'm, I feel very privileged to have you as our inaugural guest on this show. And uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, I want to get ask one more question. Uh, what kind of a grade do you give President Trump at this point with, with respect to the Second Amendment and defending this country? Ooh, that's a tough question. Uh, kind of hard to determine that. And the reason why is because he hasn't had very much come his way. Now, there's the bump stock ban, which, as most people know, was subject to regulatory removal by the DOJ. I didn't like that. I didn't like that that was punted over there or that at the federal level, uh, gun control is punted to the state level. This was in the wake of the Parkland, Florida and Las Vegas shootings in, in October 2017 and then in 18. So we lost a lot of ground. I don't like how that was handled. I have my own theories about that. I believe the president should perhaps surround himself with more true Second Amendment absolutists and people from the real, Amer real American. I love the guy. I think he's great. But on the Second Amendment, that's one of my core issues, my friend. Been that way in my life. And we all know how important it is to the big picture. Um, I'd say he needs to surround himself with less New Yorkers and less urbanites and more of yeah. the real America and people who understand guns. We're not coat and tie people. Not to put those people down. I love, there's a lot of people that work for him that have worked for him. I think are phenomenal. Yeah, but Let's be real. These folks in his family and in the West Wing are not out shooting AKs and ARs on the weekend, are they? And they, sure, they sure aren't. And you know, the people I think uh, ought to be involved in this discussion somewhere are anybody from Texas with uh, a brain and a, and a pickup that has a gun rack in it. Uh, I like people on swamp people. These guys that go out into the swamp in Louisiana and kill these freaking alligators. One-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I mean, we. I'm, I'm being somewhat facetious now, but I got to tell you, there needs to be more of a warrior culture in this country and less apologetics oh, wow. for for where, who we are. Men have given up their testicles to a large degree in this country. We're so worried about what women think, and we ought to be extraordinarily courteous to women. We ought to treat yeah. them as we're supposed to treat them in Ephesians, and uh, we are not to provoke our children or to mistreat our wives. Uh, or the women that are in our lives by any means. And at the same point in time, uh, we, uh, the body does not have a natural hole through the middle of the nostrils for you to be you know, pulled around by your neck, uh, John, or by your face. This is a nose. big deal to me, this decline of chivalry, the emasculation of our mere culture, and this emergence of this uh, yep. subculture of, of yep. beta males and so forth and the political correctness. Yeah, I'm, I'm somewhat consumed by that myself. I, I wonder, you know, when I ride the metro in D.C. area and you see these Democrat males not giving up their seat for women, especially when they're already sitting in a handicapped or elderly seat and there's like 20-something-year-old guy with his yeah. smartphone. Yeah. Of course, guys like me love to single those guys out and get them out of that seat. But, yeah, we're seeing that. Oh, I do. 
trust me, I do it all the time, man. I, I walk yeah. the walk on that. So yeah, and they probably and don't get to their destination without a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, comeuppance, which you know, a lot yeah. of people need, don't they? So uh, you would think with the war that you would see men like you did in the previous three war generations. Act like men. Vietnam. People coming out of the woodwork to join the military has, especially the army, has had a tough time making their numbers having to offer astronomical bonuses and incentives to get these kids to join. Now, Grant, there's some that'll join. I know guys have had master's degrees. There's one that was a medical doctor that quit doing that to join the military for this war. We, you know, we have like the Pat Tillman's who gave up lucrative. Uh, uh, what what football a football. man's man that guy so, was. Oh my not God. to take away from them, but the military behind the scenes has had to go through a lot to try to get these men and women, maybe mostly the problem is the men, to join our service uh, in the post 9-11 era, and that's obviously a indication of the, the, the sign of the times with that. Men should be banging down the door asking for ways to serve, uh, especially serve their country. If you're not going to join the military or you can't get in because of physical reasons, then become a cop or find something else to do. Uh, so that this overall cultural change, I know it bothers you, it bothers me. And I, I was a troop during the Reagan era. I joined the yeah. Army when Reagan was president. Yep, and I I could not wait. Seventeen years old plus one week, I was signed up, man. I was still in high school. I said, God "Let me go." Let God me bless you, John. God bless but, you. Hey, to answer your on the Second Amendment and the president, I would say a little bit more needs to happen or to assess a grade because those bills that are moving through Congress, uh, two in the House, one in the Senate that I've been tracking, uh, one that HR eight didn't even have any language for weeks. They just put it up there. And, and as we talked about last year on your show is that uh, I think they were just waiting for another shooting and then they'd fill in the blanks. They yeah, capitalize yeah. on public sentiment. And you know, I think they're the behind election. some of these shootings, John. I really do. I, I think some of this is less than spontaneous idiocy. I think there is some contrivance afoot. Uh, something brought overall, to Denver. Overall, we are going to see more violence. We already are seeing it if you charted it. Uh, by Democrats, I call them militant Democrats, Antifa's and these others. If you look at the whole spectrum from threatening violence, whether it's threatening the president or public officials, the over 800 cases documented of people wearing Trump hats and Trump logo wear being yeah. attacked. Oh. Some, some were actually attempted murders. Others were just assaults in public. Uh, in the whole spectrum, the targeting that's going on, we, you mentioned Laura Loomer a minute ago, there's a, there's a, a huge campaign by the left to target and conduct ideology discrimination against conservatives, Republicans, and most especially if you're a self-identifying supporter of President Trump. There are people being bankrupted, being run out of business, being subject to media suppression. I, uh, you know, I, as you know, I interviewed Laura Loomer for about an hour at CPAC, and it was right, right after she had her press credentials taken. She was not allowed yeah. to return into the event. Um, yeah. And I got the truth from her. I didn't know her. What I knew about her, I actually, you know, I'm not a fan of her style of journalism. I mean, I more am now, or a lot of the others out there in, that are more sensational, I guess you could say. But I, I look her eye to eye to find out what's going on. And, you know, there are up to 11 social media platforms and, and businesses that have banned her. from. She can't use Uber or Lyft, PayPal. Her own bank won't let her take donations or transactions. And then there's Facebook, Twitter, and all the other social media that kicked her off. And why is that? Well, it's a double standard, as we know, but they selectively apply these rules, probably with the help of their lawyers, so they won't get sued. She did try to sue. She sued Twitter with the help of Larry Klayman and uh, Freedom Watch, but it's, it, it failed. And she did. Yeah. So what we're seeing is a tidal wave of ideology discrimination and First Amendment infringement. People that have their businesses, that two people that I know of in California who are having their businesses targeted for bankrupting and elimination. One lady who hosted a conservative conference a few weeks ago around May 5th, uh, a one day conference. She had Charlie Kirk as a headliner. Yeah. She comes into work the next day and she lost her job. Her, she works for a private school in Los Angeles. That it's, is, it's, un, I, I would say that's unbelievable, but it's not unbelievable. And I knew Charlie right. Kirk all the way back in the eighties. And uh, uh, my goodness, that is, uh, that is just an assault on the First Amendment. And uh, it is. you as a, a prime uh, exponent and expert uh, from so many different perspectives on the Second Amendment, realize that without the Second Amendment, we have no chance of keeping any semblance of the First Amendment. Oh, We're really, there's no doubt about it. They're coming uh, after both of those. They yeah. are targeting both of those, in, and frankly, in the extreme. They have gone and so far left. 
I always say the only thing left about this show is the American flag is over my left shoulder. Other than that, uh, you know, forget about it, man. I, I don't know. You know, um, this has uh, become uh, a, a product of the American education system, which is one of Saul Alinsky's linchpins for, uh, uh, you know, rules for radicals, as you know. And, uh, yep. and Mr. Alinsky, um, rest wherever you are, um, believed that if you could get the kids on your team, uh, your success was assured. They have largely done that, and not just in New York and L.A. and San Francisco and Boston. Uh, this is going on all over the United States in small communities uh, and where you can't speak out or you will lose your job. You will, your kids will be attacked in school. Uh, the social media thing uh, has created uh, enough transparency and enough visibility out there that it puts many people's lives at risk. And, uh, you know, I think I we'll see something big on that. But I think that between what the president just initiated and now people can go on the White House website and report instances of social media infringement. Um, you know, it's I'll post it on my uh, Facebook and Twitter here after the show. But there's a link people can go to and complain to the government. Plus his public statements, he's been getting a more vociferous and outspoken about the infringement. He met with the head of Twitter. I think something's coming. I think before the election, we will see a sea change or a major event involving the social media, frankly, because they got everybody to be dependent on them for personal use and for business and, and promotion. A lot of people are totally dependent on Facebook and Twitter as part of their, I, I know a holster maker, all right, a holster maker that, of, of gear of testing. He gets most of his business through those platforms. He cannot do without it. All right. So they got dependent and now these Democrat owned social media are changing the game in conjunction, likely with their lawyers and some other execs and PR folks have figured out a way to manipulate the system so they can avoid the civil liability. Because most of the lawsuits against these social media companies, most you never hear of, by the way, but most of them have been completely unsuccessful. I would like to see Devin Nunes, you know, Congressman Nunes, who's yeah. suing for hundreds of millions of dollars. I yeah. want to see him kick some butt on that. But uh, a bad sign is that most of these lawsuits have not been successful because basically they make the rules, they insulate themselves from liability on a free service, but they made the public dependent on this, hundreds of millions of people. And unfortunately now, people are stuck uh, business-wise or otherwise. Publisher, I know of a writer who's scared to death to admit her politics online because she will lose everything she's got if she loses that account for the most part. So I think there'll be a change. You know that this president, sometimes he does things right away to fix things. Sometimes it takes him a while. But he does get some things done. He even has said in his rally speeches that, there's all these other things that people are happy that he's done that he didn't put into his campaign promises, but he knows have to be done. I think this will be one of them. I think this and the Second Amendment, we will see a change. Not to mention, we, we have to defeat the Democrats. We have to unplug their ability to have power and this menacing uh, malevolence that they're engaged in now. I think what really most people should be focused on now, you know, when you talk about fighting back, everybody wants to fight back or do something. We got to win elections. We got to take away public office from them to defang them. And then we got to figure out what to do about their propaganda network, these 25 or 30 media outlets that hold sway over public opinion. Sure. And sure. I know really, I know smart people who are still, whatever reason, they still follow CBS or CNN. I'm like, uh, what? It's, it, it's amazing. To be propaganda. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's, um, You've been okay. tremendous as you always were, and uh, we're delighted to have had you as our inaugural guest today, John. Uh, you're a pretty tough act to follow who, for whoever comes up second. Um, <laughs> you know, we are uh, looking to um, have people that are in the Second Amendment arena and firearms arena uh, advertise on this show as well, because we need to be able to cr create more and more. We need to build a bigger mousetrap. The problem uh, as you know, with uh, with YouTube, it's not what I faced on terrestrial radio. Uh, it's getting through the noise and cracking the code to get us through so that we've got, uh, you know, 100,000 people nationwide or more listening to you. And if, if they could have heard, and I don't know, I, I don't know how many we've had. Uh, Rob will tell me uh, later. But, um, you know, I mean, we've got to continue uh, relentlessly to uh, be saying the things that you say. And there aren't enough of, there are some great people out there. Uh, well, hey, Cl 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 let me say something to John, because I think- Yeah, uh, go ahead, Rob. Hi, Rob. I'm also, I also pointed my microphone at 
at, at the folks that are listening in YouTube so that so that I can kind of explain what we're trying to do, John. I mean, exactly what you said in terms of alternative media is is there's tons of us out there, but I think traditionally the problem that we've done is is that we've always said, oh well, I've got a voice, so I'm going to create a channel. But the problem, so so now what you have is this vast array, like the desert, where th there's nothing contiguous about it. So th there's lots of amazing content creators that that are out there, but it's it's not easy to find them all and align it up. And so what we're right. trying to do on this channel is is to be able to amalgamate all these independent creators and give them a channel lineup so that it's very right. similar in, a, in an experience to a radio channel or a television station. So that, you know, like after following the Clint Bellows show is the, the, the John Peterson, you know, F Firearms Magazine channel, one after the other after the other. That way we, we can ultimately build a digital campfire because the one thing that you'll see in the replay of this and looking at the comments is that as a live stream producer, I've always found that the difference between what we're doing versus news is that we pay attention to the people in the comments. So that's the difference is listening and, and having collaboration and dialogue with the audience because TV broadcasts don't care. I mean, CNN doesn't g g give a, you know, does, doesn't care about your opinion. It's propaganda. So they're not going to put they're themselves. They're not news. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to put themselves out there or allow comments. I mean, maybe they, but the point is, is that to me, this is a digital campfire. We're not trying to rep, right. replicate television because television d doesn't have accountability. And so at the end of the day, and what Clint was saying is, is the, the goal is, is to be able to stack creators and it's not all it doesn't even need to all be live it can it can be youtubers that license their content to the live media guide channel and then we you know we do their slot every wednesday at eight o'clock or whatever that looks like but right. to build it like a tv channel but most importantly is to not rely on social media long term and i and i was kind of saying this in the comments while you guys were talking is I like that approach well you know, we'll do YouTube and Facebook and Twitter for as long as they'll have us. But, you know, as as the people that are in this chat know, because they've been with me and seen the, you know, the, the crucifixion of a lot of YouTubers that are now, well, I, I think Facebook is, is probably... Now you tell me. I'm well, a little I, disappointed. We're already on our third show, and we haven't been kicked off YouTube yet. What are you doing yeah, wrong, Rob? But the, but the point I mean, is, the, the point is, is, is to ultimately launch this twofold as a permanent website so that so that it's off platform and then long term is is to also make it uh, a a ip address on the dark web so that people can then find it and rebroadcast it themselves because it's it's only through being able to redistribute this broadcast and and all the content with it that people will always be able to find it so to me it's kind of like the ham radio of the internet age a good analogy. Well, you know, what you guys are doing is vital because this increasing campaign of infringement and media suppression by the Democrats, I mean, they're wiping out some conservative voices, completely wiping out. You know, Laura Loomer is only but one of them, but there's a lot of them that are, they made a big attempt against Jesse Kelly, you know, from the Daily Caller, and he's with America's Voice News, but he got to come back. So they're going to keep nipping away at us and death by a thousand cuts. But to what you guys are doing, across the spectrum if it weren't for you all some national level media there are about 15 20 outlets that i really like that are, i think are, are trying their best or trying harder than most to be truthful and objective and use what's called journalism and then of course there's a few freedom fighters very few freedom fighters in congress who are sticking up for us and, and putting their their butts on the line and of course some people in the advocacy groups but it's this combined uh campaign of the good guys which we're part of uh, that's really shouldering the load. If it weren't for all you guys, plus the fact that the president, I think, has been doing his share um, and whipping up the public on the good guy public, that is. And, and, and I don't just say that being partisan, but look at all the people who are defecting from the Democrats to join support for the Trump movement. Uh, I've met the head of the walk away movement, Brandon Straka, the LGBT. I used, group, I used to produce right? his show. That, that's the, that's yeah, funny. And he, he was, he was absolutely marvelous to talk to. We had a, a very private talk. 
on some politics, of course, and he was getting ready to go in and speak at the Reagan dinner there. Uh, the people from five different demographics are defecting from the Democrat Party. People are waking up. But if it wasn't for folks like you guys, we would be lost right now. Well, well one of the other things that I want to add to to the yeah. by programming and what you were saying about the about the politics is, fortunately, the White House uh, and, and the Trump reelection campaign is broadcasting and, and allowing and allowing redistribution of all of the campaign rallies and political speeches. So, you know, in 2016, we had to rely on um, uh, right side broadcasting, but n now we, we've got other means of being able to do that. So, one of the things I was hopeful to be able to do c going into 2020 is is to also rebroadcast the uh, the campaign speeches and even some of s some of the the Senate and and House hearings because I think that's if we're taking public discussion and we're pairing it with conversation through comments and chat we're really being able to have a campfire discussion it, so to me that's what's exciting about it because like I said yeah. I'm interested in building community with 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 my friends and folks that, that are in the comments because those are the everyday people that I relate to not generally the people that are on television right very well put gentlemen Thank you, uh, John Milton. Uh, always a pleasure. Um, we, we'd like to get you uh, plugged in to, to this to this effort, as, as Rob just indicated, as we go down the road. And um, you know, we, we we deal with the major issues, and we're not backing off. We're not equivocating. We may have to build our own machine, is what it amounts to. And Rob and, and others are certainly able to do that. I you know, and I don't know from a technical standpoint where a few billion, uh, you know, uh, members behind uh, Facebook and Twitter at this point. But to quote Malcolm Gladwell, uh, uh, you know, big things start with small beginnings and we would hit a tipping point faster than I think people realize with this kind of an effort because it would it would bring people in, certainly from all over the the uh, civilized world and, um, and I think in the third world as well because not everybody is buying into the malarkey that continues to be talked. I mean, for, you know, take an example of uh, Laura, what's, what's her name? Alexandria Occasional Cortex uh, and her green bill, okay, which would basically bankrupt every company and every individual in the United States uh, in an effort to create laws that have never been proven, are specious, are overwhelming, and uh, uh, burdensome on taxpayers and families and everybody else. The Democrats if you're pro-family, the Democrats are against you. If you're pro-life, uh, the Democrats are against you. If you're pro-capitalism, the Democrats are against you. If you're pro-Second uh, Amendment, the Democrats are against you. I want to know, what is it the Democrats are for, okay, other than subjugation of people and uh, the rights of the elite, okay? And if you look at the bank accounts of people like Bill and Hill, I mean, when I found out that Chelsea Clinton's pulling down 15 million a year, uh, it occurred to me that, yeah, connections do matter. OK, uh, where else uh, would anybody be doing that? Um, hey, you know, Tom, here's, I got a good one for you. All right. So I know a lot of your listeners and all of us, not everybody has enough time to read into these things and try to decode the Democrats. But now we're in a very adversarial situation, probably the worst in our country since the Civil War. So it is important for people to do as Sun Tzu said, know your enemy, all right? They consider us their enemy. We gotta know about them. Here's a great way people can do it. Dinesh D'Souza's movie that came out in 2016 called Hillary's America, The Secret History of the Democrat Party. If you're an Amazon Prime video member, you can watch it for free. Uh, it's worth watching. I've gotten so many people to watch this video because what he did as a documentary is decodes the Democrats, tells what they're about and where they're going if most people saw that, they will be scared, you know what, um, about these people, and they will probably be inspired to take part and take action. I, I promote this video or movie all the time. I've rewatched it. Uh, uh, I saw when it came it. out. Yeah. So, uh, and here's one more. His, his book that came out last year in 2018 called The Big Lie, called yes. the, the Big Lie, The Nazi Roots of the Democrat Party. Or no, The Nazi Roots of the American Left. Uh, I'm on my second read of that now. So that documents how the Democrats are using the propaganda and agitation techniques that were used in Germany and Europe, 1920 to 1945. 
when you read these bo- the book or see the movie, most people for the first time, their jaw's going to drop because they're going to say to themselves, my God, this is what they're doing now. Don't believe me, folks. See the movie, read the book. Very the sobering. Book. Very, very, very sobering. And uh, not enough people uh, have seen that movie. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that goes all the way back to Andrew Jackson, who, uh, you know, we, I mean, you know, I mean, we we can all agree that uh, there were some good things uh, that he did for the country in his term in office as the seventh president of the United States. He was also a big time plantation guy and owned hundreds of slaves. Uh, right. And basically, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, this whole racist card gets thrown around a great deal too, and uh, typically by Democrats and by globalists versus the nationalists of America. And I got to tell you, Rob, uh, we the only problem I have with getting guests like uh, Peterson on the show is that they know too much. OK, they're, they're, there's just too much content there. And, um, you know, uh, we love you, man. So, uh, you know, we're happy that you continue to play the role that you're playing with respect to the Second Amendment and with, you know, promoting people using effective and safe uh methodologies with respect to handguns and self-defense weapons. Uh, we've got to stand strong because it's a slippery slope. And, you know, this, as you say, the death of a thousand cuts, these things don't happen overnight, but at some point they reach a critical mass and then they're unstoppable. And uh, I think Donald Trump has given us a break like Ronald Reagan did uh, in the 1980s, uh, where we have a chance to take back uh, some of the momentum. Oh yeah. Of these guys. And, uh, there's uh, no doubt about that. And, okay. and, 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 and uh, you know, and, and that is why they're out to get this guy. They are so committed to bringing him down. Uh, Pencil neck geek, uh, Alan, Adam Schiff from California. And uh, the, the, I call him little boy and fat man, Nadler from New York, who, I mean, they're both launching their own independent congressional investigations into Trump. Uh, but nothing is ever said about the role that uh, that Obama and Eric the Withholder played with Fast and Furious and uh, destabilizing the American southern border even worse than it was. Nothing gets said about what happened at Benghazi and how we failed to deploy troops to, to bring those people out. There are, I think know, it's coming, Clint. I think something's coming. I With Barr in place and folks like you and all the top media that are putting the word out and getting the public informed, as you know, the public is demanding action, whether it's on Hillary's various scandals, you know, racketeering, the emails, and on and on. And what happened with Obamagate and Spygate, I, nobody believes me, but I really think we'll see some accountability. We'll see some indictments or arrests. Well, I hope so. And we'll I know, I know, the I know that Bill has told her uh, that he will visit her uh, at us at, uh, I forget, not Sing Sing, but the other, uh, well, it's a federal crime, so she'll probably do time in a in a uh, country club like environment, but she can she can speak at uh, at lunch groups every day in prison. That'd be a good good use of her time. You've been a great use of our time. Thank you very much, John Milton Peterson, for appearing on our show. And uh, Rob, I want to come back to you. Uh, we're going to try to bring uh, John on again uh, within two weeks, John, if we can get on your rather busy schedule. So uh, absolutely, thank you. it's great to have you on. Rob, can you cut back to me and I and I I want to I want to talk and see what uh, what kind of reaction we've got to uh, our, our conversation with John and uh, uh, what else is out there. Well, so, <clears throat> so lots of feedback. Give me the, some uh, of it, if you would, please. Uh-oh. Uh, so and, uh, Peterson, you, say, can hang saying they would... you, you face the enemy. You can face our Twitter customers. <laughs> okay, I will. All right, man up, man. Okay, here we go. Well, so the, so the audience loves everything that John was saying uh, with respect to the, the Second Amendment. Uh, they love the idea about being able to br- bring content creators together in a lineup. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really kind of excited how, how all these miscellaneous things are kind of gelling and coming together. I mean, like... See, I told you that I had these kind of people out there, okay? And I don't know if you and Rory Sauter believe me or not, but but John is right at the head of the class, but we've got uh, serious talent on this team, okay? We're loaded from top to bottom. We're like the 27 Yankees, okay? Well, so, like- for, so for what you have in, in, in terms of being able to get top talent, I have, have some of the best... Not I have the best moderators on YouTube that 
Cool. Yeah, and and so it's like if you pair good conversation with amazing moderation, that's that's to me the way. Well, you're doing social. a pretty good job today of wearing a number of hats as you always do, <laughs> and uh, you know, to me, the Second Amendment is is one of the critical things. One of the things we talked about, though, John and and uh, Rob, uh, in our preface to our the rest of our comments today was the fact that God is not a Republican, he's not a Democrat, he's not even an American, he's not a respecter of uh, humans, he's not a respecter of groups. He is above and beyond, he is the great I am, the Alpha and the Omega, and he will not put up with the kind of crap that America is throwing down, and it's coming from the left, okay? Uh, we're on the proper, I would say the right side, but we already know we're to the right. Uh, we're on the proper, we're on the correct, we're on the humanitarian, we're on the good guy side of these issues and none well, is go ahead so, 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 so let me say this because this is something that i was listening to i was listening to a podcast on my way back from philadelphia today and it was about gaslighting and narcissists and it's you know when, when we watch television and and i contrast when we watch television but then i see that the conversations that happen in the chat they're not even related to each other and so you know what? What I've observed is is that I almost feel like like the media has has gaslit the the American people because they they presented a reality and have eliminated history to to something that most Americans don't even recognize anymore. It's like television television preaches that racism is rampant and it's it's everywhere. And yet, my growing up, it was absolutely nowhere. I mean, that's how and I went I went to an integrated high school in downtown Omaha, Nebraska, where Gail Sayers and Amon Green, among other people, went to school, as well as Henry Fonda and Dorothy McGuire and a whole bunch of people. Uh, we, uh, you know, it wasn't perfect, but uh, the kind of widespread uh, confrontational racism that the Jesse Jacksons and Al Sharptons and a whole nother generation now people are, are promoting is an artificial issue. And, well, uh, it's, it's artificial, but it's a money maker, and and so that you know, it's like they're shakedown artists, <laughs> is what they basically are. Yeah. yeah. At the end and of the so, day, you could wherever, wherever you see conflict going on in the media, uh, you know, and and even going back to to the, the establishments of religion, it's it, you, there, there's the money. I mean, uh, and and the Bible does not talk about. I mean, God warned us about. The establishment of religions. I mean, as a Christian, it's very. The Bible is crystal clear that it's a mono e mono relationship. That that you know. It is a talk, relationship. It's not an organization. It's a, uh, but it's a personal it, relationship. It's a personal the, relationship. Isn't yeah. It? You, you and I yeah, talked earlier this afternoon right. about the the. the I, I will. I, I won't go too too sideways on it. But I mean, the Bible is very clear that that. There's no intermediary. There's no papacy that, that we're supposed to intermediate through in order to, 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 to pray and talk to God. We're supposed to talk directly to, 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 to Jesus through our prayers. Um, so I'm sure, I'm sure we'll have a discussion about that. On no, and I, we, we, we probably will, but I have to say I do find a great deal of psychological value in confession uh, because uh, uh, with my sin nature, it would be great to talk to somebody on an almost daily basis about where I've screwed up. I I remember seeing Dennis Miller in concert in Orange County years ago when we were, when the uh, the crisis of uh, child abuse was uh, rampant on the Catholic Church, if you guys recall that, um, and it still is to some extent. But uh, Miller said he went to confession. He looked in the confessional. He saw the priest. He's, this guy looks so downtrodden uh, and, and crestfallen. He said, "Okay, uh, uh, you go first. Okay, and." Uh, it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's uh, basically, we, we can't trump human nature, pardon the, pardon the pun. Uh, we are sinners and we're going to fall short and we're going to do things or we're, we're frequently going to do them again and again and again, even though we say, well, I'm sorry, I, um, I made that mistake, Lord. And, uh, you know, please grant me the grace and the insight and the, uh, the, the discipline or whatever's involved. Uh, to see the light and to move away from that sin. We are to trust and obey, okay? And the obey part of it seems to be a tough part um, uh, for uh, many people in this country. We live in very much of a, of a you know, a, 
a credit card oriented pay later, um, you know, speak your mind with, with respect to your rights, but never your responsibilities. And, and I mean, you don't have to go too far on YouTube or on Twitter. James Woods, who is one of my favorite players in Hollywood and has been an outspoken conservative since before 9-11, has been, at least for a while, was kicked off of Twitter and Facebook. I think they put him back on because of the backlash. Uh, John, maybe you heard the same thing, but, but uh, he came to the FBI and said, I was on a flight from, um, from uh, New York to, to uh, Los Angeles, and I saw five guys sitting in first class that uh, matched the, the guys that pulled this thing off on 9-11. They were the same people. And I reported that to the appropriate uh, federal and state and local uh, law enforcement agencies. Right. They laughed at me. Do you remember that, John? And yes, I do. And I, I was in place working at Homeland Security uh, in one of the organizations focused on that uh, two years and one month after 9-11. I got back from the war and I started up at DHS right away. Yeah, I'm pretty intimately familiar with that. And uh, it's pretty sad that we, we got caught with our pants down. We got caught by surprise by these jihadis on 9-11. Now, the opposites occurred now. that They've had a Herculean effort, most of it the public doesn't see, to prevent the larger catastrophic type attacks. That's why we really haven't seen any of those, uh, right. because they did finally get their act together at the federal level. I got to be right on the inside of that. I really, frankly, it was very gratifying. It's sad that you know, we had to lose several thousand people uh, to get to this point. But it, yeah. the public should know yeah. that I've, I've seen it from every angle I can think of, like from TSA and, and Homeland Security and the intelligence community and other work I've done in the military and so forth. Uh, so that part is looking pretty good about catastrophic attacks. And because all we were really worried about back then at 9-11 was a nuclear attack, right? Or a foreign country attacking us, which we secured pretty well for that. And we have a, a quite a formidable capability to deter it. Uh, and I got to see a bit of that myself as well. But um, it's the thing that we still have a risk for is homegrown violent extremists and these individual jihadis. So we usually work in one to three one to three person cells. In some cases though, they'll have 50 to 100 people supporting them, providing what's called material support to terrorism. Uh, but some are in fact lone actors and they'll still do things like drive a truck through a crowd of people. And ISIS and the other groups are depending upon a network of people to do that. The other scary thing we have now, Clint, is a lot of these ISIS fighters that were in Syria and Iraq and some in Africa and Afghanistan, we didn't kill all of them off. Many of them just jumped ship and went back to their home countries. Many of them had their passports from Great Britain or wherever they were from. Right, right. Australia. Some are tracked, some are not. So the problem we face now, the threat added to the homegrown violent extremists who are self-radicalized are an untold number of possibly tens of thousands of militant uh, Islamic terrorists who are trained, who have actually killed people, who have been part of organized formations in Syria and Iraq and so forth. Uh, and that were not killed off, and now they're hiding among the populace in the civilized world, being the United States, Canada, Europe, and a few other allies. Right. They're, they, they're home again, and not all of them are being tracked, because we didn't know who all of them were to begin with, but we do have people who track that. So the public, going back to what you said about being armed in Second Amendment, yet another reason for the citizen to go yeah. armed publicly, lawfully, and trained, hopefully, uh, in knowing what you're doing whether there's an active shooter or mass shooter uh, or Antifa types or these jihadists, not to mention random crime and stalking. There's quite a list of reasons why people should put more emphasis on self-defense, but some of that is because the citizen is the last line of defense from whether it be terrorism or, uh, you know, incursions, uh, uh, for, you know, from outside our borders and so forth. Our territorial defense, I don't think, a smart country would attack our country or Switzerland, you know, two of the more heavily armed populaces in the world. It, yeah, it would be a full day. Uh, yeah, the Swiss so, have a good angle on the whole thing, and uh, it seems to work for them. It's almost mandatory that you own a firearm in Switzerland, isn't it? I believe uh, it's something. Well, that... but yeah, there's Swiss Army, you know, you get issued a rifle, and then they go into what's basically a quasi reserve status where they can do periodic practice. So, yeah, there's fully automatic Swiss rifles. Actually, was issued one for three years. 
when I worked at Six Al at a gun company. I was issued the rifle that many of them have and, and shorter barrel versions. So it's kind of a real treat to shoot those because they're amazing guns. Uh, the, the Six Al 550 series is what I'm referring to for the people who are familiar. But uh, I think that, yeah, certainly people should consider that in their daily life, their personal protection. Uh, but you notice too, these terrorists and these groups, they attack places that are soft targets or they think they can get away with it. Schools and banks, and of course, in all the anti-gun states, like the San Bernardino attack a few years ago uh, yeah. during Obama, and the many other in New York City, they look for places that are gun-free zones that appear to be soft targets where they presume that there are not people who are going to be armed to oppose them. Granted, when they've tried suicide bombings or truck rollover terrorist attacks in Israel, they got shot up. Okay, you know, there's people roaming around in Israel with concealed carry guns and off-duty military. And luckily, there's been a number of occasions where these people, you know, drew their weapons and took care of business. But in our public, the problem is we have the gun-free zones and places where there's restrictive concealed carry or no concealed carry. And guess where these bad guys gravitate towards to do their attacks? Yep. Both the criminal element as well as terrorists. So if you live in one of those places, especially you want to have your concealed carry permit or whatever you got to do to protect yourself. Uh, I'm not saying I think anything will get worse, although individual and small attacks by individuals or small cells will be more common than the larger attacks that we saw in the past. That, that for the reasons I already stated, uh, the rising tide of militant Democrats the, and these Antifa types, which are another anomaly uh, that we should take seriously, the ISIS rebels that have returned from overseas with training and motivation to kill people, uh, I mean, who do you think did all these beheadings and other uh, debauchery and, and barbarism? Uh, they didn't all get killed by our airstrikes and by our troops. They, they escaped. You can't do everything uh, with drones, can you? And uh, this has been uh, a, you know, we get, we get, when you talk to John, Rob, you, you, you kind of branch out into a lot of important areas uh, because nothing is disconnected. You can't compartmentalize things like the Democrats like to do and just say that one thing really doesn't affect the other. You know, we really right. started an intelligence fall off and you could go back to the Vietnam War, I suppose, if you want to do that. But when Carter went into the White House with Frank Church on the Senate uh, uh, Intelligence Committee running that, that liberal from Idaho, and then he bring in Stansfield Turner to be the director of the CIA, um, you basically have lost your human intelligence gathering to a major extent in the late 1970s. And isn't it interesting that since then, we brought back Bill Casey, a former real spy under Ronald Reagan and a great guy. I met him a number of times, but it's been spotty ever since. And we've got great people out there in the field. We know a lot of these things are going to happen, but we don't respond to them. And, you know, I really believe that uh, for a fraction of the dough that we spent investigating Donald Trump for things that didn't happen in Russia, we really ought to get to the bottom of what happened in Benghazi for a lot of reasons. Okay. And, uh, you know, I mean, um, I think there were some real crimes involved there and dead Americans. And um, those people, for one reason or another, John, have gone unpublished or unpunished. Rob, uh, how are we doing? What's what's the latest from Control Room? Um, let's see here. We've got a few comments coming in. Uh, that, that was pretty cool that you hopped into the uh, comments to say hi to everybody, John. And uh Yes, I did find my way into YouTube. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so it looks like you picked up a few uh, a few new subscribers. So thank you guys very much for. Uh, you mean for... I got Peterson on the show and he's getting more people than I am? That's the way you do it, right? You ingratiate I, and I, you yeah, ingratiate well, I, I, and, I, I, and treat your host. I, I, <laughs> well, I'm glad he is. Nobody deserves it more than he does. So that's that's that's, right. that's all good, and it's important that they listen to John. So uh, and, and that's, you know, my philosophy in business and politics and everything else. I wanted to be the dumbest guy in a, in a, in a room full of smart people uh, that, that were pursuing goals, and objectives that I thought were critical. And um, and I've proven to be the dumbest guy in many cases, but um, it's OK. You know, uh, I don't need yes people. Some of these issues are commonsensical. Uh, as John was talking earlier about, he'd never seen an automatic weapon leap off a shelf and kill somebody. I mean, it's yeah. just that 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 logic is just out. It's out there. I mean, you know, if you went and dragged the East and the Hudson River around Manhattan, you'd probably find ten thousand handguns in the bottom of those of those uh, of those uh, waters. And um, you know, I mean, it's the the bad guys are always going to find a way to be armed. 
And, uh, you know, this is a little, a little talked about fact, but if you looked at the ultimate demise of the Roman Empire that lasted 2,000 years, what are we working on, about 244 or something now? Um, yeah. They, you know, the Romans went down largely because of unlimited immigration over their northern border, and they allowed their enemies to become armed, and be, the, we get, they gave them enough slack that they put them in a position where they thought they could take down the Romans, and eventually, with the demise of the moral climate in Rome and the weakness of the emperors that they had and what happened there, uh, the enemies were able to do that, where generations earlier, they, they, were, not, they were a non-factor. I mean, Hadrian went into into Britain, and I'm not sure what year this was, uh, but it's not too far uh, from the from the Dark Ages, and built a wall, uh, Hadrian's Wall, across the entire continent, or, or excuse me, island of uh, of Great Britain, and uh, you know, similar to the Great Wall of China, not as long, but an amazing engineering feat, and uh, because he saw uh, people coming down from the north, and we're talking about the Scots and. Welsh and some other people that we don't generally think about as bad guys. Uh, the Romans uh, took an ultra defensive position for a long time, like we did in World War One and Two. Uh, yeah. But we've lost that now on some level. We don't, we, or we don't pull the trigger on it. We got too many politician generals. That's just my opinion. Um, and um, we do. My, my my opinion also, gentlemen, is that we've come uh, almost to the end of this program and. Uh, um, you know, we have been joined today by John Milton Peterson uh, here on the Bells Unplugged. Uh, we're going to, you know, this is um, a lot of people get up and say they're doing things that are going to shift paradigms or create significant um, impact, They're disruptive technology, it's sometimes called. And I don't want to get uh, out over my skis too far or talk a, talk a bill that my uh, checking account can't handle. But I think we have the potential here, gentlemen uh, and gentle ladies, to reach out. And um, I know we had in the community of Omaha, Nebraska, which is, you know, uh, a million people, roughly. Um, we had 30,000 listeners a day, according to Nielsen. And, uh, and so the show was unique. We're going to continue to make it that. We're not going to uh, we're not going to hedge on anything. And. Uh, we are going to respect people. Um, I did. I did lapse for just a minute, and I, I, I mentioned Hilda Beast. I'm sorry, Hillary. I didn't mean to do that. Okay. Um, you know, four uh, you know pantsuit makers went out of uh, business the week after the election, in 2016. I don't know if there's a connection there or not, but um, Hillary continues to speak out, and uh, we're still trying. She's out there with O.J. Simpson. He's trying to find who killed his wife. And she's trying to find out who lost the 2016 presidential election. So um, there seems to be at least a little bit of uh, of, uh, of, of uh, reluctance to accept reality. And uh, we don't want to be guilty of that in this country. John, thank you so much for being on the program with us today. And uh, we're going to try to track you down and uh, my, your substantive comments all. Uh, I hope people were taking notes over what you said. You, you know, and... I've had a number of people graduate, I guess, from my show and have found themselves on Fox and even on CNN. Uh, and I would, you know, I would suggest that, that, you know, John's a guy that's, you know, I don't know how they haven't, uh, maybe they have, but uh, this kind of knowledge is, uh, I don't know whether it's, it, it, Rob, whether it's intentionally uh, muted or controlled or uh, attempts have been made to, uh, to uh, eliminate it. I believe that is the case. We need to know who the enemy is. And on some level, the enemy ultimately is us. And, uh, you know, as um, uh, the, the gentleman who headed the 9-11 uh, commission said, he was former governor of New Jersey. What was his name? Tom uh, Byrne or something. I don't remember. But, uh, and that commission had, among other people, it had the woman who was um, I believe it's the FBI or the National Security Agency or CIA. I don't remember which group she was with, but she was a counsel uh, to one of those three groups. And she was responsible for creating protocol that kept those three or four agencies from talking to each other and sharing intelligence information. And so the various groups, and I, for the life of me, I can't think of her name right off the top of my head. She, 
they put her on the on the 911 commission okay if the, anybody shouldn't be on that commission it should have been her and maybe years later now i'm being a little picky on uh, we ought to forget about the past and just go forward but we've got to get the right people into the game too and um and we've had them on this program today and and those of you who are listening to us out there rob i'm going to come back to you one last time uh who what is dm telling us is going on in, on the in the cyber world relative to bellows unplugged and, and our excellent guest well so, so dm had to leave uh for, for a little bit but uh but uh patty picked it up uh so we, we got a f- few uh, additional subs forbidden information subbed and uh, jervis subbed and yeah so it was, it was a really good conversation i mean for for, for a lot of for a lot of uh, these folks they hadn't seen your content before they i i sent them links to some of the stuff i was playing around with last week um on the on the channel but this was really kind of the first time that they were able to see and participate and interact with us in the the uh, in the chat. So it was it was really good and it, and you know having John on was fantastic. So better and better every time. Well, I guess I succeeded. I I, I always want to bring talent. Uh, I'm uh, I'm like Casey Stingle, manager of the Yankees, when they won eight World Series titles in eleven years, and nobody talks about Casey Stingle. They talk about DiMaggio and Barra and Mantle and and the great Yankee players. Uh, Casey put him on the field, and uh, so I am delighted we were able to get John on today, and we, we hope to continue to, to get him back on a fairly regular basis. And, I mean, we've got uh, some real uh, intellectual and some real real-world talent uh, that's out there on all of the major issues, all these mythologies like John's automatic weapon jumping off the shelf and killing somebody. Uh, that is one of the mythologies of the gun control uh, uh, groups. They, it, it, it's just, you know, it, and I, when I went to law school 100 years ago, these far left professors, uh, mostly from Ivy League schools, were all promoting this crap in, in, in criminal justice classes and, uh, you know, criminal procedure and constitutional law. And it's amazing, given the attacks on on the Constitution that we're in as good a shape, frankly, gentlemen, as we are at this point. With any luck, uh, Ruth, uh, well, I, I wish her well health-wise, but one must suspect that perhaps she is, uh, uh, I hope not near death's door, but she is at a point where her energy level probably is not adequate to meet the demands of uh, uh, an associate justice of the United States Supreme Court. So maybe we will uh, see her uh, move away from the court. And uh, as, as Rob said, we're moving up on 2020, and this is going to be a real rodeo, okay? Uh, we are going to see all kinds of stuff. As I said earlier, there are 26 candidates in the Democratic Party for president right now. 25 of them are trailing the lead candidate, and he's a fellow um, by the name of Voter Fraud is his name. And uh, he has more votes than any other um, a member of the announced candidates in the Democratic Party. And uh, so we'll see how Donald Trump, will he have a different nickname for all 25 of those candidates? You know, uh, in 2016, we had to have two different sets of Republican debates. It was like Hollywood Squares. So if you set up Hollywood Squares with these 25 boneheads, who would you put in the center square, Rob? Yeah, okay, Hillary, we're out of time. Uh, Thank you very much, folks. This has been Bellows Unplugged here on the Rob Hicks uh, radio network, and uh, we're delighted you've joined us today. Uh, As you can tell, we're sorting through it. There's some style things we can improve upon. I hope you didn't see uh, the dirt on my glasses today. And um, we're going to be back, and uh, Rob, we will be announcing, uh, I guess, on my Facebook page uh, when we will be returning for our next show. So that's what we've got for today, folks. Have a great evening. Be safe and God bless America. Make America great again.